There we go. Okay, so we are going to finish up with a couple of uh, fairly unrelated topics in um, the muscular system. So we're going to start by looking at uh, smooth muscle characteristics in a little bit more detail. So we, we looked at smooth muscle tissue when we started this system, um, but now we're going to compare it to um, how it works now that we know more about how skeletal muscle works. And then we're going to finish this up with a little dive into physics and take a closer look at how um, the muscular system works with the skeletal system um, by making use of long bones as levers. So we'll start by looking at our smooth muscle stuff and we'll end with the lever stuff. I swear there was a slide that was supposed to come before that, but I guess not. Okay, so when we look at the anatomy of smooth muscle cells compared to uh, skeletal muscle cells, um, remember that smooth muscle cells are fusiform, right? So they've got that round fusiform shape and they are more normal cell-like. So they're fairly normal size cells, uh, single nucleus. Um, they're not striated, so there's no striping. And now that we've learned that striations are as a result of the sarcomeres in the myofibrils, that tells us that they don't have that same massive amount of myofibrils bundled together and all running in parallel. So we'll take a little bit of a look at what they have instead that still allows them to be contractile. Other differences that we see, so the sarcoplasmic reticulum is still present, however it's less developed, so it's not quite as massive and it doesn't store as much calcium. Uh, the smooth muscle cells also don't have T-tubules. Instead, they just have these little infoldings called cavioli. You can think about it as meaning little cave. So they're just these little caves which still increase the surface area of the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane, and they have calcium channels so that when these cells depolarize, it's releasing calcium into the, um, the sarcoplasm, both by allowing it in and then releasing the stores from the SR. So there's a higher dependence on extracellular calcium, which skeletal muscle really doesn't have at all. Skeletal muscle is pretty much only using intracellular calcium, but smooth muscle actually needs some of it to come in from the outside. And when you eventually get to cardio um, vascular system, you'll see that it's uh, sort of like that for um, the heart muscle as well. And here's our picture from before. So a couple things I didn't go over before, and we're not going to spend a ton of time on now, but there's actually two different kinds of smooth muscle. Um, based on how the nervous system controls it. Most of it is located in these walls of hollow organs. And some of it has specific locations. So like this is showing us the muscle inside of our eye. It all looks the same, but it gets controlled in a slightly different way. And there's better control over here. So we'll cover how that works uh, in a couple slides. So we also see that the nervous system control is different. So there's a different part of the nervous system that controls uh, these um, involuntary parts of muscle. And we're going to learn more about this when we get to the nervous system itself. But autonomic nerves are the ones that control smooth muscle versus those um, somatic motor neurons that control the skeletal muscle. So the autonomic neurons, uh, they don't actually have neuromuscular junctions with the individual smooth muscle cells. Instead, they just kind of end in these little bulges that we call varicosities. 
So they just kind of have these little endings um, near the muscle and they release the neurotransmitter sort of in a diffuse fashion so that it affects multiple cells at the same time. So this makes the control less specific, but that's okay because smooth muscle pretty much always acts as a unit, just together. Um, and it's typically arranged in a sheet in the wall of a, of a hollow organ. So it's okay that it works that way. Um, now, in spite of not being striated, it's still perfectly capable of contracting and it still has contractile filaments. So there are still thick filaments um, composed of myosin, although there are of course less of them. Um, however, instead of the heads of the myosin being just on either end, like we see in skeletal muscle thick filaments, you know how they're all like on one end and then they're on the other end. Well, here they're along the entire length. And that has important implications for how much shortening can occur. Because we're gonna get more shortening if there's heads along the entire length of the thick filament. We can have more overlap. The thin filaments also still composed of actin, but in this case, there's no troponin. So there's a different regulatory molecule called calmodulin that binds calcium instead. Does the same thing, just it's a different protein. So very similar, but slightly different. And the arrangement is the really big difference. So the fibers are arranged in these diagonals. It kind of gives the whole thing a diamond lattice work type appearance. Um, and they connect, instead of being connected at those Z disks that we learned about before, they're connected at these dense bodies. Those are what are anchoring the thin filaments. And so then we'll have like a, a, a sarcomere in between two dense bodies, and they're all gonna be arranged along this um, pattern that is, uh, that is uh, supported by these in intermediate filaments. So remember, those are one of the proteins of the uh, cytoskeleton. One second. Okay. All right. So um, this uh, arrangement uh, is why we don't see striation. So because all of the the myofilaments aren't all in parallel the way they are in the, that's not what I wanted to do. Because they're not all in parallel, all the sarcomeres aren't in alignment, so we don't get that stripe. So the pattern is still there, but they're not all um, aligned, and so it's not visible at the same level of magnification. Um, the other thing that this is showing here is that the cells themselves are pretty tightly attached to each other, not dissimilarly to the cardiac muscle cell, although not to the same degree. So we're going to have things like desmosomes and gap junctions in between the cells that keep them electrically connected and tightly connected to withstand tension. And that's, of course, because in hollow organs, there's a lot of stretch uh, that can occur, and we don't want these cells to be pulled apart. So this is just a different picture of it in case it works better. It's pretty much showing you all of the same things um, as the last picture. It's just a slightly different uh, diagram from a different place. But this one's pointing out your thin filaments with your actin and your thick filaments with your myosin. So since we still have thick and thin filaments, the basics of the contraction cycle are the same. So we're still using the sliding filament mechanism. We're having this cross bridge cycle to generate force and tension. Um, and it's still being triggered by cytoplasmic or intracellular calcium. And it's all being fueled by ATP. So all of that is the same in spite of the fact that um, you know, we're using calmodulin instead 
of uh, troponin to bind calcium. Um, most of the calcium that comes into the cell is actually coming from out of the cell instead of from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, when calmodulin binds calcium, it activates an enzyme called myosin kinase, and that actually activates myosin, which is a bit different from the troponin moving the tropomyosin and revealing the active sites on the actin. But either way, we get cross bridge formation once myosin and actin are able to bind to each other. And that cycle will continue as long as calcium is present. So when calcium levels decrease, then we're going to end the contraction cycle. Um, but in this case, it's a little more complicated, the detachment of myosin from actin. And that's actually to the smooth muscle's advantage. Oh. Okay. So this is, um, I've shown you this before, but this is sort of what it looks like. So smooth muscle cells tend to kind of corkscrew together as they get um, contracted. They're able to shorten quite a lot more um, in mass compared to the skeletal muscle. Um, and they're able to hold their contraction for a really long time. So the complication that we're not gonna go into the details of with the uncoupling process of the cross bridges allows them to stay contracted with very minimal energy input. So they don't have to continue to cross bridge cycle. They can simply stay in a cross bridge. Um, you don't need to know the details of this. I was just trying to show you some diagrams of contraction. So this is just showing you calcium coming into the cell and um, calmodulin allowing myosin and actin to bind and then relaxation. And the rest of it is more detail than anybody needs to know right now. So it takes smooth muscle 30 times longer to contract than skeletal muscle. It's very, very, very slow. But as you might remember from talking about our slow oxidative versus fast glycolytic muscle fibers, um, slow usually comes with an efficiency. So even though it's super slow to contract, it's much more efficient. So smooth muscle is able to use only 1% of the energy that skeletal muscle needs to use in order to maintain contraction. Um, it has a really, really slow ATPase. So remember ATPase is the one that breaks ATP down to ADP. And that is what energizes the myosin head so that it's able to then move later. Um, and the myofilaments are able to do something called latching. So unless they deliberately uncouple, they'll stay connected. And that means that the smooth muscle can all stay at a certain contraction level and just stay that way. And this is how smooth muscle maintains tone. So smooth muscle is pretty much always slightly contracted. Um, and that helps maintain appropriate levels of pressure in our various hollow organs. This is especially important in our blood vessels, which really shouldn't ever be fully relaxed in order to maintain appropriate blood pressure. Um, but it's also very useful in places like our, our small intestine and our other hollow organs where a lot of the time we always want them to be contracted. So smooth muscle is very weird when you are used to how skeletal muscle works, but um, it's very, very good at doing its job. I think that was everything. Nope, one more thing. Oh, that's right. Yes, control. Okay, so um, how it's regulated um, is also a little more complicated. So uh, remember that at our neuromuscular junctions, those motor neurons release acetylcholine and we get contraction. And that's how it works. It's off or it's on for skeletal muscle. Um, but there are um, multiple ways for smooth muscle to be controlled. So, um, 
the autonomic nervous system can control some of this stuff in several different ways um, using different neurotransmitters to have different effects. Now we'll talk about the details of that when we get to the nervous system. And other things are also able to exert control. So um, the hormones that might be released by local organs or by endocrine organs, um, changes in local environment, usually these are things like changes in pH, oxygen levels, carbon dioxide, um, things like that. And nitrogen, uh, nitrous oxide can also do it. Um, and there's reflexive action that can be performed by the smooth muscle as well. It's able to have spontaneous contraction. Usually it does this in response to stretch. And we'll talk about stretch reflexes when we get to the uh, digestive system. Basically, if you stretch a hollow organ, that has smooth muscle, the smooth muscle will reflexively constrict and then it'll relax. And that's how it deals with that. And that helps, again, regulate things like the, the pressure inside of that organ. Let's see, there it is. Ah, look at that, I wrote it down. Um, so yeah, that's the stretch relaxation response is reflexive contraction when stretched. Um, but if that stretch continues, then it'll relax and that allows expansion of hollow organs. And that explains things, for example, like how you might think you have to pee, but you don't have time right then, so you don't go. And then a couple minutes later, you don't have to pee again for a while. And then like half an hour later, an hour later, you're like, oh no, now, now I have to pee. And that's because you were filling with urine and you stretched and so you constricted and it made your bladder feel really full, but you were like, no, we don't have time for this. And so then that muscle relaxed and kept filling. So that's um, stretch relaxation response. And then um, there's also a length tension relationship with smooth muscle, but it's a little bit different compared to skeletal. So smooth muscle is better able to generate maximum tension um, with a larger range of starting length. So if skeletal muscles length tension relationship is like this, smooth muscles is like, I don't know, it's like here and it goes all the way over there. Um, because of that like lattice work diagonal um, relationship and because there's mice and heads along the entire length of the thick filaments, um, they can be really stretched out and still get maximum tension, um, which is something skeletal muscle can't do. And so again, that makes it better adapted to being in the walls of hollow organs that are made to stretch or relax um, and can be at a variety of lengths when they might need to contract maximally. All right, so this should be the last thing we talk about with smooth muscle. So um, that picture I showed you before where, sure, it's in the walls of the hollow organs, but then it can also be in places like your eyeball. Um, it gives us two different types of smooth muscle for control. So everything I've been talking about um, has um, applied to the standard type of smooth muscle, which is called unitary or visceral. And this is where we have that very diffuse control by the autonomic nervous system. Um, the, the muscle cells pretty much all work together. So the, the cells work as a group. And so you don't need to control individual cells or units or anything like that um, because you're, you're trying to get a whole sheet of muscle to work together. But there is this second type called multi-unit. And in multi-unit smooth muscle, which is far less common, um, we actually have the cells working independently. So when we have this independent um, function, um, it's typically gonna be places where we need to have a little more control over the degree of contraction. So we end up with more nerve endings. So we actually have motor units, which is why we call it multi-unit. Um, so that gives us graded contractions. 
And so we see this in places where we need that fine level of control. So that's going to be in the larger airways and larger arteries. So these are places where um, controlling the exact diameter of this hollow organ um, is really important. So either for the amount of air that we're able to bring in or for blood pressure. And then the other places are places where there's just small amounts anyway. So those are rector pili muscles in your hair follicles. You're going to have a little bit more specific control over. And then finally, your pupillary muscles. So these are the muscles that control the diameter of your pupil, you know, from when your eyes are really dilated versus when your eyes are really constricted. So they're controlling how much light is entering your eye. And so we need that to be very finely controlled to match lighting conditions and other factors. Um, and we'll talk about those details when we get to special senses. So there are these guys that are controlled in a way that's more similar to skeletal muscle, but the vast majority of smooth muscle is unitary and works just like we've already talked about. So again, here's those varicosities and for unitary, um, they're just kind of spread throughout and you know we're kind of just dusting the whole area with neurotransmitter to control it and there's a lot of junctions between these cells connecting them so that they're able to work together and then i think i put there we go um, whereas with the multi-unit see how we kind of draw them as separate cells because they're all being controlled independently so they're going to have they're still going to be more like varicosities but they're going to be more individualized ones to control them separately. Okay, I don't remember why I left that there. Okay, so that's sort of the extra detail of smooth muscle. Um, I don't have anything like that for cardiac because when you get to the cardiovascular system, you'll cover those, um, those types of details in the um, microscopic anatomy. But smooth muscle, because it's part of a lot of systems, um, doesn't get covered in quite the same way. So I like to make sure that it gets touched on. I, I think I mentioned that before. Any questions about smooth muscle? Okay, so the thing we're going to tackle last for the muscular system is levers. So levers kind of goes back to what we talked about when we started the skeletal system, which is that long bones function as levers when muscles contract and that can result in movement. So we're going to look at a little more detail about how that actually works because of course there's a lot more detail to it and what we usually see in the body. So this is a little bit of physics um, but it's uh, physics as it applies to the human body. So a couple of terms for you. A lever is defined as a rigid object working around a point of rotation and the point of rotation is called a fulcrum to increase the force applied to an object. So this is everything from, you know, using a pair of scissors because the blades of the scissors are actually levers to, you know, using a shovel to shovel things. That shovel is acting as a lever as well. Um, so the effort is what we call the force applied to one side of, an, of the lever. This is the input. And then the load is whatever resistance on the other side of the lever um, is opposing the force. Oh, I never know, oh, is applying force. Okay, so for example, if you're using scissors and scissors are acting as your lever, then your effort is whatever your hands are doing to cut 
and then whatever you're cutting is your load is is your resistance and if you're using a shovel then you know your your body your arms are going to be applying the effort and the load is whatever dirt or whatever it is that you're trying to actually shovel So this is kind of a basics of how we set up a lever system. So we're always gonna have a fulcrum that sets our point of rotation, our rigid lever, and then um, one of these is gonna be our effort and one of these is gonna be our resistance. When we look at the human body, of course, our bones are gonna be our levers, for the most part, our long bones. Um, are our major levers. Uh, the joints are acting as our fulcrums or points of rotation. No. Um, and then the effort is going to be applied by our muscles and where they attach to whatever bone is moving is where the effort is being applied. And then the resistance or the load is whatever we're trying to move. So like this, for example, is showing you um, a concentric isotonic contraction, sorry if that's not actually legible, um, of your biceps brachii at the elbow to lift something in your hand. So the load is adding to the effort down, but even if your hand was empty, just moving the weight of your lower arm would be your load. And then your effort is however much contraction your biceps has to put in to make that happen. I thought I moved this, but I think I just copied it. Okay, so uh, there's actually three different types or classes of lever based on the relationship between the location of the fulcrum the location of the effort or input force and the location of the resistance or load. Um, and we'll go through them one at a time. Come on computer. Nope, okay, go through them right here, cool. I always think, oh, I'm going to make them separate pages, and then I don't, and then I forget. Okay, so basically, uh, give me one second and let me, no, I don't want to keep them. Let me make a blank slide here so that we have something to work with, and then we'll come back to this. Okay, so there's a couple different ways we can have a relationship between these things. So we can have our effort on one side of the, the fulcrum, and we can have our load on the other. And this is called a first class lever. All right. And this is where your lever system basically works like a seesaw. So, you know, whatever you're putting in here is going to be um, reflected on the other side. But you can also have your effort and your load on the same side of the fulcrum. And so then you have two options. So if your effort is farther away from the load, or farther away from the fulcrum than the load, so let's say you're gonna pull on this, and it's going to move this, um, then that is going to be, I always get them mixed up, excellent, that is going to be your third class lever. I don't know how they came up with the order of these things, but they did. And then if your load is farther than your effort, so um, you're pulling here, to move this, then that's gonna be a second class lever, okay? But it's about the arrangement of these three points, effort, fulcrum, and load. 
okay so when we look at this this is showing you the same thing it's using slightly different terminology because they all do um, so here is our first class lever where the fulcrum is in between and this is how basically any hinged instrument we have scissors wrenches wire cutters, whatever, um, are all set up as first class levers because you're putting in force on one end. The point of rotation is the little screw that holds the two sides together and then your output force is the blades on the other side. Um, and you'll see this abbreviated as effort fulcrum load or EFL as your first class lever. I don't know why they went with that and not the other way around, but they did. Um, your second class lever, so a wheelbarrow is a great example of a second class lever um, where your fulcrum is on one end, your load is in the middle, and then your effort is on the edge. So this gets abbreviated as an ELF. It's the only one that really works. Um, so that's your second class lever. And then your third class lever, fulcrum, effort, and load on the end out here. Um, and they don't exist very often other than in the human body, as it turns out. And so the classic example we use all the time is actually the same biceps contraction that we looked at before. And you'll see this one abbreviated FEL just to make things confusing. Okay, so we have these three classes of levers and they all have um, advantages and disadvantages. So we're going to look at the major advantages, disadvantages, and see um, who's got what. So the big advantage that we usually think of when it comes to levers is called a mechanical advantage. So the idea is that we're going to increase the output force relative to the input force. Basically, we're going to be able to, say, move something heavy with less effort than if we weren't using the lever. And that's our bait, like that, when we think about how levers work, that's the thing we usually think about. Like that's the point of a lever. It's not actually the only point, but that's kind of the major thing. In order to actually achieve a mechanical advantage though, we need our, uh, our load to be closer to the fulcrum. No, to be closer to the fulcrum than our effort. So regardless of whether or not they're on the same side, as long as our, our um, effort that we're inputting is a longer distance away from the fulcrum than the resistance or the load, we're going to be able to get more force out than we're putting in. So you can see this example is a first class lever where the effort arm of the lever is shorter than, um, or sorry, the, the load arm is shorter than the effort arm. But you can also, of course, put your load right here and make a second class lever, and it's always going to have a mechanical advantage because by definition, a second class lever has the load closer to the fulcrum, right? So this length is always gonna be shorter than that. So mechanical advantage, when a lever has a mechanical advantage, it's also called a power lever because you're getting more power out. And it's easiest to understand how this works when we look at a first class lever because first class levers, of course, um, sorry, uh, because first class levers can um, have this or not, right? So we can have, because there's one on either side, if we put our load way out here and our effort here, then we don't have mechanical advantage. 
but if we put our effort farther out, then we do. So we can look at the difference there with scissors as an example. So standard set of scissors, here's our point of rotation, our fulcrum, and our effort arm is this long, and our load depends on where we're trying to cut. So with scissors, you can of course try to cut at the tips of the blades, but you can also kind of choke it up and try to cut closer to the fulcrum. So when you're trying to cut closer to the fulcrum than the length of your effort arm, you achieve a mechanical advantage. And we say that it's whenever Whenever the number we calculate is greater than one, then we have a mechanical advantage. I didn't go over the formula there. So mechanical advantage is determined by the effort arm length divided by the load arm length. So as long as the effort is greater than the load, we get a number greater than one. That's all that means. So this just means effort arm is longer. So um, if you've ever tried to cut something that's a bit thick, maybe thicker than you should have been cutting with scissors, then you know that you can't, you can't get there with just the tips, right? You have to like really like jam it in there and, and bear down. Um, and that works because now you're achieving a mechanical advantage that you wouldn't have when you're cutting out here because out here the, um, the load arm is too long. So when our load is farther out from the fulcrum than our effort, we say it has a mechanical disadvantage. So when your mechanical advantage is less than one because your load arm is longer, then you don't get as much force out. And that sounds bad, but there is a trade-off. So just like other things we've talked about, there's a trade-off here between force and speed. And even though you're not getting as much force output as you're putting in, you are getting more speed. So when something has a mechanical disadvantage, it has a speed advantage. And so we'll also call these guys speed lovers. So when we look at it just from the point of view of whether there's a mechanical advantage or not, it looks like there's like the good levers and the bad levers. But really there's power levers and speed levers. So here we have the same class one fulcrum of scissors, but now our load lever is gonna be longer than our effort. And so now we might not be able to cut very much thickness of paper or whatever it is we're cutting with these scissors, but we could do it really, really fast. And you know that might not be that great for scissors, but it can certainly be an advantage in the body. So let's look at some examples of these levers in the body. Um, give me one second and see if I can stop the incessant barking. I'm gonna pause the recording. Okay, so examples in the body. First class levers. So levers where the load is on one side of the fulcrum and the effort is on the other. Not super common um, in, um, in the body. Uh, so one of the classic examples that we use is this right here. So this specific, nope. this specific example is being able to tilt your head back and look up. It doesn't work the other way, mind you, just this way. So when we're tilting our head back, the point of rotation is gonna be the atlantoax, or not the atlantoaxial joint, the um, Atlanto-occipital joint, so the joint between the first vertebra and the base of your skull. And the muscle, I'm so glad that worked. Okay, so the muscle here, sternocleidomastoid, important muscle, right? 
um, between your sternum and the mastoid process of your temporal bone. This is providing your effort, and you can see it's quite close to your fulcrum. And then your load is actually like the weight of your entire head. And so what you're doing here is you're pulling on one side and that drives your whole head back, okay? So first class lever. Very few of them in the body because we don't have very many examples where um, the, the effort is on the other side of a fulcrum from the load. And so that means that when we look at second class levers, we also don't have a ton of examples. So the singular one that I can usually find is standing on your toes. So if you lift your heel, your, and you're balancing on the ball of your foot, so now your fulcrum is here. The effort is all of these muscles pulling with this tendon. And your load is the weight of your body through your heel. So now your effort starts way back here. Your load is in between the effort and the fulcrum. And you have a lovely mechanical advantage and this is pretty much the only time it happens. Useful. When we really want good examples though, we go to third class levers. Third class levers are so common that basically if you're not sure, it's probably a third class lever in the body. Um, and that's because of the nature of how muscles connect to bones. So we know that, um, you know, muscles are gonna connect across at least one joint. So in this case, our fulcrum is our elbow, right? Cause this, again, this is our classic third class lever example. Um, and a lot of them attach surprisingly close to their fulcrums. So you would think that the biceps tendon would want to attach way down here, because if it was way down here, then we'd be getting more effort out or more, um, more power out for what we put in but instead it attaches right here so close to the elbow and our load then is everything else off the end of your arm when you're contracting your biceps so this puts you at a major mechanical disadvantage which makes third class levers always power levers so they have to be because by definition a third class lever has the load farther from the fulcrum than the effort. And that means that they're always at a mechanical disadvantage. Sorry, why do I write power when I don't mean power? Oh my God, hold on, erase, erase. So if they're always at a mechanical disadvantage, then they're always speed levers. I apologize. As always, too early in the morning. Okay. Um, and then our little like non-physiological example here is, is tweezers. So with tweezers, your fulcrum is where the two um, sides attach. Your effort's going to be in the middle, right? That's where you're going to put your fingers and your load is on the end. And so you don't have a lot of power when you're grasping things with tweezers. Uh, that's why we don't have sharp tweezers for cutting, you know, because that wouldn't make any sense. So almost every lever system in the body is a third class lever, which means that we are almost never at a mechanical advantage. Um, and that just seems weird. Like you'd think that we would want to get power out um, but it turns out that we often don't. Um, it can vary though too. So I really like this one because it shows you the same basic setup, but how you're holding the load in your hand affects which class of a lever it is. So here we have somebody holding a ball in the palm of their hand. The fulcrum is always right here at the knuckle joints. And 
The effort is always going to be the flexors. So those are the digital flexors. Um, hopefully you have at least started to find those at some point. So they're gonna pull about here. <clears throat> and what this is showing you is that depending on how you grip the effort or grip the load, hmm, um, you can change which class of a lever and that means you can get different things out of it. So this is showing you how when you're, um, when you're holding it like literally in the palm of your hand, um, you're basically functionally um, at a class one lever. And um, this is a, a nice strong grip, but um, you know, there's only so much you can do about it as far as a, you're just sitting there, you know? Um, if you actually flex your fingers here, then it shifts the load over here. And then you go to a class two grip. Um, that's going to be um, even stronger because now you've got a really solid mechanical advantage. But if you shift the ball into your fingertips, now your effort is in between your load and your fulcrum. And so you've gone to a class three lever. So now you have a more precise grip, but it's not as strong. So the, the reason that I point all this out is because again, this is a constant trade-off that we have, okay, between speed and power. And the reason why most of our levers are class three, again, is the nature of how our muscles attach to bone. But that also shows us that from an evolutionary standpoint, speed of body movements has been more important than strength of body movements. And we could definitely be stronger. There's a lot of different ways we could have evolved to be stronger, but that wasn't what was saving our lives or our ancestors' lives. Um, so if you want to look up something interesting about that, this is a fairly brief article about why chimpanzees are stronger than we are. So, you know, at the at a, le a, a lower body weight, a chimpanzee is easily stronger than a person. Um, keep that in mind if you ever meet them, they can tear us apart. Um, and there's a lot more information in other places, but this one's a nice, quick, easy read. Um, if you want to know more about lever systems, these are a couple of decent um, resources as well. What else? Oh, I got nothing else. Okay. Does anybody have questions? This is kind of a tricky one, um, and you kind of just have to like write it all out for yourself to see how it works. Any questions? Um, it's not about this, but when will you post like the recordings? Sorry, post the what? The recordings like of the last session and everything. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, the recordings should be up now. If not, I'll get them up right away. So the the recordings from Monday took a little longer because I had I recorded them to the cloud. Um, and let me actually, speaking of recordings, I'm gonna stop this one then because we don't need this. <clears throat>